uh, to a large degree, and I gotta say there are there are there are things we don't understand, we don't have the complete picture, but we have a very large part of it now. And what we're gonna talk about today, and before we get into it, I'm gonna talk about the concept of geologic time. What we're gonna talk about today is plate tectonics. How do the all right, how did the plates get where they are? We all know the plates are moving around the planet now like ice skaters on a pond. This is a relatively new concept in geology. It's only been around for a few years. Uh, but that's what we're gonna talk about today. Before we do that, let's talk about geologic time. Geologic time is something that grad students in geology have a hard time understanding. The, the human brain cannot fathom how big a billion is. A billion is so big, we just don't have that part of our brain that can really picture that accurately. So we do things to think about ge geologic time in different ways because it's so vast. How old is the planet? Anybody want to guess? Or you've heard a bunch of different. Uh, Anybody knows? Um, uh, I I may be completely wrong here, right. but a billion. A billion. That's a good guess. Sixty million. Sixty million. A uh, little bit older than that. One more guess. I just want to get an idea where you guys are roughly thinking. Just another guess for fun. Five hundred. Five hundred million. Okay. The Earth is four point five billion years old. And we know that with a great degree of accuracy. I'm not sure what the accuracy is if within a million years. It'd be like 99.999% accuracy because of all the radioactive dating we've done. Um, now, 4.5 billion, as I said, incredibly large number, hard for people to fathom. So what the Museum of Natural History does in New York, when you first walk into the rock exhibit or the uh, human biology exhibit, they break time into a 24-hour clock. They've decided that this is the best way to look at it, that the beginning of time 4.5 million years ago is 24 hours ago, and that they're gonna look at the Earth as if 24 hours goes by. So we're gonna talk about that for a second. It's 12 midnight, now, and we're gonna go around the clock now. One, two, three, four, five, six in the morning, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 in the afternoon. Not much has happened in the way of light forming on the planet. Um, two billion years have gone by in 12 hours. Okay, now it's one in the afternoon, two in the afternoon, three, four, five, six, seven, it's getting to the evening, eight, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, one hour left in the 24 hour clock, and dinosaurs appear. Okay, so we think dinosaurs, I think, dinosaurs have been around forever. Some of the oldest things we can imagine in our head. Dinosaurs just appeared an hour ago in a 24 hour clock. You with me? Okay. I'm, I'm breaking the whole history of the planet down as if it was 24 hours, as if it was one day, just to, to think about it differently. So now 23 hours have gone by since the beginning of time and dinosaurs just appeared. Okay, now stick with me. It's 11 o'clock, dinosaurs just appeared. At 20 minutes to midnight, there's only 20 minutes left till we get to today. The dinosaurs go extinct, okay, only 20 minutes ago. Man appeared four seconds ago. Okay, and the 24 hour clock, man appeared four seconds ago. Our, 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 um, our ancestors that are 200,000 years old, our direct ancestors are 200,000. We have distant ancestors that are 4.5 to 6.5 million years old. But our nearest ancestors, 200,000 years. So they appeared four seconds ago. So that uh, tells you, we just got here, okay? Uh, as far as the history of the planet goes, are you with me? As far as the history of the planet goes, man just got here. Now what have we done to this planet in four seconds? We've destroyed it. We, with, with global warming and greenhouse gases we emit, and virtually every expert in the field, the climate expert in the field, uh, and I'm talking about, again, a lot of 99 percent, but 99.9 percent .9 of scientists believe man is the cause. Okay, the good news is for all you people who become scientists is most scientists feel it's reversible, that it can be stopped and it can be fixed. It's not, you know, it's, it's a dire situation, but we have to address it. So that's the good news. I mean, I think that's the upside, is that you guys could have a role in that. Okay, I'm gonna do one more thing on time because uh, sometimes the 24 hour clock doesn't work for people. So I'm gonna really give you just another one to, to try to really quickly, so you can appreciate the vastness of geologic time. Uh, just for a second, assume that one day is a grain of sand. A little grain of sand you find in Jersey Shore. You barely see it, it's that big, one day, okay? One grain is one day. If you line up those grains end to end to end to end along your finger, that's your lifetime, okay? If you then take those sand grains and you go back here to your elbow with sand grains lined up in a single row, each grain is one day, that's when the pilgrims got here. If we were to line those grains up um, 
from here to Central Park, from here to 57th Street, I'm saying that's five miles, I think it's about five miles, I don't know. If you were to line grains up one after another, that's when the dinosaurs appear. Okay, now, if you were to line these grains up from here in New York City to, let me try to get a map for you here. No, excuse me. Uh, from here in New York City, you were line these grains up one after another, end to end to end to end, all the way to the equator. Here's the equator going right through South America. That would be the beginning of the Earth. So just think about every one of those grains is a day in the history of the planet. That's how fast geologic time is. It'll help you think about things as I go forward here today. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I was just wondering, Yes, uh, dinosaurs appeared 225 million years ago. So from 4.5 billion to 225 million was a time where there were plenty of other, uh, 575 million years ago, there was, uh, life started to bloom in earnest from single cells up through uh, plants, up through uh, some marine animals, up through land plants, then land animals, sharks, and you, you know, sharks have been around for, uh, you know, I'll get the number wrong, but, uh, way longer than dinosaurs, I think maybe over 300 million years. Uh, and then the dinosaurs came 225 million. So the, the, there was a vast amount of life before dinosaurs. Go ahead, yeah. Wait, um, but all the way around the equator, would that be like the beginning of the universe? Oh, I don't know. I, I'd have to get a calculator out that could handle trillions. And we could, and if we agreed what the beginning of the universe is, which nobody has agreed upon, uh, we could come up with that. But I don't, I don't know the answer. Do you know how much longer the human race has? Uh, the, the human race has as long as it, it takes care of the planet, and that could be forever. Uh, if we don't take care of the planet, um, who knows? I thought it was yeah. There's nothing to worry about, however. Just be a scientist and fix the planet. So do you think that's a No, they, okay, that, all that is is an ancient religion that's both. Basically, we as scientists uh, have spent the last few centuries trying to figure things out. I can, I can guarantee the Mayans 2,000 years ago did not have much of a clue about science, nor did the people who... Well, whatever, I don't want to get into that part. And, uh, okay, here we go, here we go. This, let, me, let me move on just for a second. This is, um, you, you guys have uh, uh, seen this diagram before? We're only going to talk about the outer crust here. The outer crust on the planet is a thin eggshell of, uh, relative to the, to the whole uh, Earth. We're going to talk about two kinds of crust. One, the kind we're standing on right now, which is, some of you already learned this, I think, continental crust. And the other kind is in the ocean. It's called oceanic crust. Ocean, they have very different physical properties. Oceanic crust is thin and dense, and therefore sinks. Continental crust is thicker and lighter. It floats like an ice cube in water. Therefore, we can stand on it. We don't get flooded by the ocean. So it's very important that we have two kinds of crust. Um, the, uh, the continental crust, just uh, order of magnitude, 25 miles thick, maybe on average. Uh, the oceanic crust, uh, 10 to 15 miles thick on average. 25 versus 10 to 15. We're going to spend. We're going to see this map a few times. This is the most valuable map in geology for my money. This map did not exist before World War II. The reason we have this map is because in World War II we were getting attacked by German submarines. Our friends were around the world, and we had to defend ourselves. We had to put our submarines out there. And when we put our submarines out there, we did not want our submarines crashing into underwater mountains or coastlines that they didn't see or didn't know were there. So we mapped the world. We sent our ships out. They sent sound signals down, recorded the return of those sound signals, and they mapped the floor, the seafloor. And lo and behold, we never ever knew before that that we had mountain belts, huge mountain belts, uh, uh, ringing the entire planet. This is 10, 12,000 miles long through the entire Atlantic Ocean. This is 8, 10,000 miles long in the Pacific. This jet, you can imagine the scientists when they first saw this data, is the holy smokes, what is this? That was 1942, whatever, around the 40s, early 40s. Um, the science of geology and the history of the Earth has been completely reworked since then. And really, it took 20 years past this time, it took them to 1960, in your parents' lifetime, basically, for people to really appreciate what they learned. And we're going to talk about what they learned. In the next 20 minutes, we're going to explain exactly how this got here, what it does, how it affects the Earth, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the Mid-Pacific Rise. We're going to talk about that. That's the first big trend. The second big trend we're going to talk about is this mountain belt right here. It goes from Tierra del Fuego through Chile, Peru, up through Central America, North America, Alaska, over into Russia, completely around the Pacific. 
there's a mountain belt that rims the Pacific. That's the second trend we're gonna talk about. The third trend we're gonna talk about is harder to see on this map, but it is a huge trend. It's this dark line. Can you see this dark line? Okay, this dark line parallels exactly that mountain belt. You don't have to be a scientist to think whatever formed this mountain belt had to form this dark line. This dark line is a deep trench. It's the deepest oceans in the world are right at the coastline. I would have thought to get to the deepest uh, oceans in the world, you have to go by boat four or five days out in the middle of the ocean, and there you would be in, in the deepest part. The deepest ocean is right at the coastline. You could be in a small boat, some place you could be in a rowboat, a couple miles out, the water could be 5,000 feet deep, 10,000, 15,000 feet deep, right there. You can see out as far as the trenches are in a lot of these places. Now, the deepest trench in the world is 35,000 feet deep. How, how tall is Mount Everest? Anybody? That's very cool. Yeah. Um, um, it's Mount Everest. like 30, it's like, um, uh, 10,000? No, it's, it's uh, 30,000, 29,000. But 29, it's not the, it's the highest mountain in the world. Highest it's mountain in the world. It's not the tallest one, so. Six, thou six miles, roughly. Okay, this trench, the deepest trench in the world, you can put Mount Everest in that trench, and you could have a mile of water on top of Mount Everest, and you still would not be out of that trench. That's how deep this kind of feature can be. It's a Marianas Trench, it's in the west side of the Pacific. Um, so these, tr these deep water trenches are a major feature of the, of the planet, and they are one for one relationship with this mountain belt. So you don't have to be a scientist to realize or think that whatever formed the mountains formed this trench. And we're gonna, we're gonna, you guys are gonna know how that formed, how that happened in another 20 minutes. Hang on one second. And, and after 20 minutes, if you understand how this formed, how this formed, how, uh, how the trenches formed, I would say that, you know, roughly speaking, you, uh, you can understand, or you do understand, how 50% or whatever, of a very large percentage of the planet is formed. You can tell anybody how it formed. You can look at a book or take a trip and see these features and say, I know how that formed. All of a sudden, it's a little more interesting than just looking at a mountain and say it's a mountain and taking a pretty picture of it. You will know how that volcanoes form around the Pacific Ocean. So just stick with me here. Uh, this is a map of our plates, our major plates. We have uh, thousands of plates on the planet. Uh, California probably has hundreds of plates. These are just the major ones. All of the major plate tectonic activity happens along plate boundaries. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is true, but isn't it when the plate tectonic shift, doesn't it create an earthquake? Absolutely. Yeah. That's what we're going to talk about. All the motions that can happen along these plate boundaries. So very good. Uh, and these are the motions. Plates, the, along these boundaries, things can either spread apart. There's only three, th they, really only three things they can do. They can spread apart, they can collide, or they can move along one another. So uh, we, got, we have spreading, we have the collision is called subduction. You should write that down because if you haven't had it yet with Marsha, you're gonna have a, a lot of it. Subduction, you, it. you got it right there. And then the last thing is um, slip balls. Things moving along, um, and, and you know, there's no magic to this. Let, let me just—if we had two tables together, we had two tables sitting here. The relative motions between those two tables are exactly the same thing. You can either spread them apart, you can collide them, or you can move them along one another. There's no magic to the fact that these are plates and they're doing that. But these are the relative motions that we're going to talk about. We're going to spend more time on the first two: uh, spreading and collision. Wait, but can't one plate ride on top? That's of that's there? collision, and it can do it in various ways. We're going to spend a bunch of time talking about that. Okay, spreading apart. This is the same map we saw a minute ago with the plate boundaries, but now there's little numbers on it. The little numbers are in centimeters, and they are the how the rate at which the plates are spreading apart. So in the North Atlantic, it's 2.3 centimeters. Uh, how many centimeters in an inch? Anybody? How many centimeters? Anybody? Two and a half. Two and a half. 2.54. This is 2.3. Essentially an inch a year. New York is in, in Portugal are spreading apart one inch every year. They're getting an inch further away every single year. An inch is how fast your fingernail grows in a year. Okay, it does not seem like a lot. In your lifetime, moving at an inch a year, at the, by the end of your life, Portugal will be six feet further away from New York than it is today. So you go, well, how do you get an ocean that's 3,300 miles wide moving only an inch a year? Well, that's what geological time does. 
We'll show you that math in a second. Small movements over vast amounts of geologic time give you very, very large features. In fact, we'll talk about Mount Everest. Mount Everest has only formed in the last 10 million years, the tallest mountain in the year in the, in the world. 10 million years would be um, three minutes ago on the planet. It's like no time at all. Three minutes in a 24-hour clock. Okay. Now, yeah. We're going to talk about the mechanism in a second. I, I, I'm jumping ahead to let you know what it is doing, but I'm going to tell you how it does it or why, how we think it does it. Okay, one inch a year is a lot. Down here in the Pacific, down here in the Pacific, that's 17 centimeters a year. So five or six inches a year. That is so radically fast in geologic terms. It is so unstable. And so we, we said it a second ago, but where those poor people in Chile have to deal with, like, you know, every other year, they've got some of the biggest, what, you know, earthquakes that, on the planet and regularly. Because this is it really, it, uh, it, it's, it's not a, a situation that would go on for hundreds of millions of years. It's a very unstable situation happening in the South. Okay, I was going to ask that. You, you've been in a Chile earthquake? Which one? Well, it was like, you know how it shakes? So you felt it shake? For, for how many seconds? Little. Handful of seconds. Let me let me keep moving. Hang on a second. Um, I want to ask a question now. I usually wait a little bit. Has anybody else been uh, in or near an earthquake? Not in this country, but in another country. You know, with uh, Japan. 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 A couple years ago, in this class, kids sitting over here started talking about the Indonesian earthquake. Now, you guys were young, 2004, but uh, 225,000 people died in that earthquake. Um, and this kid and her twin was uh, in, in Sri Lanka, not in Indonesia, across the ocean a little bit. Uh, and they saw the tsunami, the uncle saw the tsunami coming and took them up uh, three stories. And they were fine. But uh, I, I have to ask a question because, you know, the last thing I want to do is talk about, like, the Japanese earthquake. If somebody here lived through it, because that would be like, that would be terrible. What's that earthquake in like 1989 during the World Series or something? Yeah, yeah, San Francisco shook. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, the bridge collapsed. Yep, yeah, the, the, the Bay Bridge. Uh, the Bay Bridge collapsed. Let me, let me talk about the mechanism. And we're, we're, we, we got ahead of ourselves a little bit on the earthquake thing. Um, this is the mechanism of spreading. The mantle is hot. When things are hot, think of a hot air balloon. What's a hot air balloon do when it when expands. It expands and therefore rises? So the mantle is super hot, molten lava, it's gonna to wanna to rise, it finds a weakness in the crust, and the crust is rock. There's gonna be cracks. It, 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 it takes advantage of that crack, and it starts to peek through that crack. It doesn't do it in a point, it does it along the whole crack. So you're gonna get a line of volcanoes. Now, the process by which scientists describe this is like a conveyor process. The molten lava is gonna come up the volcano, it's gonna cool, and the density of that is gonna, and the heaviness brings it down the side, and more molten lava comes up, and more lava comes down the side and it basically just keeps going. So you get an ever-widening ocean, um, and, and it's depicted here. Now we know that the planet is not getting bigger and bigger. We're not gonna be as big as Jupiter someday, but the oceans are getting wider. So we know that the, the crust is being formed, but cr crust is also being destroyed. And crust is being destroyed in the next section of the talk, is in those subduction zones. So this, you've all seen a map like this before, I believe. Uh, this is this is what we think the plates have done over time. They've moved around like ice skaters on a pond. We had one large continent over here. The molten lava found cracks in the con in, in the in the crustal in the continental crust. It, it took advantage of those cracks, came up in the form of volcanoes, and spreading began. And the and the continents started to move further apart. This is 100 million years ago, 50 million years ago, and today. Now, if let's say we're in, this is all. The fact that we know that these things spread apart is really only, as I said, since the 1960s, okay? In the 1800s, if you were a scientist, which there were scientists said, look at this, this looks like a jigsaw puzzle. How could this not be joined here? How, it had to be. But you would have been run out of town as a quack, say it, because who would ever believe that something the size of South America could move around the planet at will, or Africa could move around the planet? at will. Nobody believed it. We didn't have the mechanism, we didn't have the physics, the understanding of physics, to believe that could happen. So all you can say is it kind of looked like it fit. 
In the 1960s, we started to piece it together, and we have this spreading mechanism in the oceans. We saw the map from World War II. We now understood it, how it happened. And, and oh, by the way, we had fossils from here in Brazil. We had fossils from here in West Africa. Glossopterus, we had a fern, the exact same fern. We know ferns don't swim. Ferns are in a field. How in the world are they the exact same thing? They were in the same field at, at one point in time, 225 million years ago, and then they spread apart. Now they're spread, split apart by 2,000 miles of ocean. Um, so that, that evidence was not enough to convince people uh, that, that we had plates that moved in the 1800s. But this, uh, I, I think it's interesting when you go to science as this young. You know, math, physics, and, and chemistry, a lot of those princi principles have been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, 400, 500 years. Geology, the stuff we're talking about, 30, 40 years. That's all we've kind of, 50 years. That's kind of all we've uh, uh, known about. In my generation of uh, exploration geologists in the 18, oh my God, in the 1980s, we were the first generation of kids that could use this information, that could go through, uh, take the, the learning from the 60s, go through college, go through graduate school, and then get a job in the early 80s and apply this stuff. We were the first generation that was lucky enough to have these tools. So we could, we could go around the planet and re-explore for oil in places they never thought there could be oil, just because they didn't have this theory, this, uh, this, uh, this theory that pretty much brought the whole concept of the Earth together. Um, this is the math that helps think a little bit about the vastness of geologic time. We're, we're talking about our ocean. Uh, the distance from Portugal to New York City is 3,300 miles. If you just get a calculator out and you put that in inches, it's 210 million inches, okay? Portugal is 210 million inches from New York City. We're spreading at one fingernail a year, one inch a year. So one inch a year, and we need to go 210 million inches. It's not complicated math. The answer is right here. One inch a year, 210 million inches to get an ocean that wide. How many million years would it take? 210 million years. The math works. The rock record corroborates that. It all makes sense. It all fits together that this Atlantic Ridge could spread at that slow rate and give us an ocean the size of the Atlantic Ocean in 225 million years. Seems like a long time. Again, 225 million years is when the dinosaurs appeared. That's just an hour ago in our 24-hour Earth. Does that make sense to you guys? Yep. Okay. Now you understand how this entire thing formed. And by the way, if we understand how it formed here, do we need to go here, 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 here to understand? No, we do what we extrapolate out. And we say, we have to assume that whatever mechanism is forming this volcanic belt here, it's the same one that formed all this up here. Now we have been down in, in uh, submarines, man, unman. We, we, there's arms on those subs, they've taken samples. We've had videos of it. I'll show you a video of it. Uh, we, we know this, uh, the, the mechanics of this in great detail. However, as I showed in the beginning of the talk, geologists really like to kind of walk on things with a hammer, sample them. And so you always look for something that's accessible. So this is 5,000 feet under the water, these ridges. We would like to find something that's above sea level. We don't have to have a submarine around us or a wetsuit. Where, look, look along this trend all the way up and tell me what do you see that kind of gets in the way of the trend and blocks the trend. Somebody hasn't said anything, somebody. Um, this, this little thing here, that little thing there. What's that little thing there? Anybody? Somebody might have spoken. Island Nation. No, no, Iceland. Iceland's the only place on the planet where you can stand on a mid-Atlantic ridge or an oceanic ridge and see every day on dry land what, what's happening. So this is what Iceland looks like. The ridge comes in and the ridge goes out. And on land, it is, it's a, a mess of tectonic activity, as you might imagine. It's the only place on the planet where you can touch the North Atlantic Ridge, North Atlantic Plate, North American Plate, sorry, and the European Plate. You can actually go there. I was there last year. You can actually touch. Theodore is actually. Um, uh, oh, is that, is that um, I'm going to Iceland. You're from Iceland. Okay. No, I'm going to Iceland this summer. I mean, winter. Um, but like, is that why federal is geothermal activity? Yep, we're going to talk about that like right now. Hot springs. Absolutely, that's the exact reason why. And you're, you're from, Iceland? from Iceland? Where in Iceland are you from? Right um, well, my dad grew up on a farm. 
<laughs> Don't choke on your candy, okay? Yeah, but um, I'll have a house in Reykjavik. In Reykjavik? Beautiful little town. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so you, you do, you know, if I say something wrong about Iceland, you'll let me know. Usually I get away saying anything I want because nobody's from Iceland. <laughs> this is what it looks like when you live in Iceland. This is your backyard. This was in the 1960s. Okay. Three days later, this is what your backyard looks like. It's full of ash, and you cannot live there anymore. You, you have to move. And so Icelanders have been very good about, is that what they call them, Icelanders? Yeah. Icelanders? Mm -hmm. Icelanders have been very good about uh, figuring out where to live on their island and in order to avoid this sort of disaster. Having said that, in the human history of Iceland, which goes back thousands of years or more, and I would say that you probably know your family back how many generations in Iceland have you mapped your um, family? Really far north. You can go on um, a website in, in Iceland and you can find your whole family tree. So back to whole, how many years ago? I don't know, like really, really far. Hundreds and hundreds, hundreds. and hundreds. Everybody knows everybody's name. I've sat with a family up there talking about this. Everybody's name back a thousand years sometimes. So if somebody died in a volcanic uh, event 300 years ago, I mean, it's, it's a real thing. So a bunch of times in, in um, Iceland's history, there's been volcanic events that have killed large percentages of the population. And what happens in a volcano is ash goes up into the air, and that ash can change the climate. So the volcanic activity can kill people. But uh, there, was one, there was one event in, in uh, Iceland in the 1800s where the ash went into the atmosphere, it blocked the sun filtering through, and crops failed in Europe the next summer. And people died in Europe because of it. And back then, they didn't have trucks and boats bringing you, you know, carrots and peas. You ate what you could grow in your area. If you couldn't get food, that was a famine. So volcanic activity has has, has huge, huge impact. Uh, this, uh, so I, you know, this is my family vacation in Iceland. We went in March. Really bad time to go to Iceland. As it turns out, it's really cold and really difficult to drive, but it's still a beautiful country. This is a geyser. What's a geyser? Geyser. Just. Uh, Okay, Iceland expert. Okay, um, it's like this. I've been to a couple of. Times. You've been um, to this guy's, right? Yeah, I know yeah. you've been to this. Okay, guy's. so it's sort of like a water. It's sort of like water, but it like comes up, and it's really hot, and it's just like such a cream. Yeah. I don't know how it's like. It's it's like water. Yeah, explosion water. water. It's like water from the core of the earth being being in steam. Exactly. Okay. Water is a, a creek, river flowing underground, which well, all creeks and rivers flow underground at times. Uh, it, now, Iceland, we said it's on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. There's molten lava that's very, very shallow, very near to the surface. It's very hot. The water's flowing along. It's doing fine. It superheats like, like uh, water in a, in a teapot. You know what happens to the steam in a teapot? It all of a sudden erupts out of the teapot. The teapot can't contain it anymore. So while the earth and the cracks in the earth could contain the volume of water, the steam now just explodes, and it comes out any crack you can find, and it comes out like this violently. Now uh, we have a really famous one in our in our Old Faithful. The most famous one in the world is Old Faithful. It erupts almost every hour. I mean, it does erupt every hour. It's a little bit off. Uh, I will tell you guys that everybody talks about how great the, the guys are in Iceland. They are in Russia. They're supposed to be great. If you ever want to see a, a, a geyser, you just have to go to Yellowstone National Park. We have more geysers in, in Yellowstone than the rest of the world combined. Okay, you can't swing a stick without hitting a geyser in Yellowstone. And I would say before you go to Disneyland or anywhere, uh, go, to, go to Yellowstone. It is the most amazing place on the planet. Uh, this is me on my vacation standing near a little volcano. This happens in a little geyser. This is what happens under the ocean all day long along these ridges. In Iceland, you can go up and stand there and touch it. And as I said, that we as geologists, that's what we like to do. Now in America, we would never be able to stand this close to this. This is shallow cavities underground, hot water flowing, perhaps even maybe some magma at times. In Iceland, anything, you don't care. You just walk right up to it and touch it. I mean, you don't, this is kind of stupid standing here, but it was fun to be near it. Somebody mentioned hydrothermal, geothermal power. The Wait, beauty of Iceland is being on the ridge, with all this magmatic activity down there, you can get your electricity very cheaply, your house very cheaply. You drill a hole into the earth, shallow hole, you, uh, you put a pipe down, you bring the pipe back up, you pump water down that pipe, you bring the water back up, and you use that water to heat your house, and you use that water to, to power the turbines in your factories. And so we have, uh, or Iceland has, had a, uh, well, it's a pristine place, one of the most beautiful places on the planet, naturally speaking. 
corporations from around the world have relocated to Iceland because they can get electricity very cheaply. Uh, the, the government has made deals with companies, so companies have been, electricity can be one of the most expensive costs of goods sold when you're a manufacturing concern. So if you can get it cheaply, you're gonna move your factory and your workers there. And so uh, that's happened, and Iceland, I think, has been pretty good about managing it. It's, it's sort of upsetting to see these big factories on the outskirts of uh, Reykjavik, but you know, uh, that's progress. I'm gonna show you a video, and what you're gonna see is the video's gonna start out on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge with the magma erupting under the ocean. It erupts in big round things. We call these big round things pillows. Because when you see them in the rock record, they look like pillows. It's called pillow basalt. You're gonna see what it looks like. It, 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 lava above the earth uh, on dry land comes out and it flows. And it'll, and it'll, it'll cool it kind of in a flat laminar way under the ocean in pillows. You're gonna see that. The camera's gonna come up over onto land up on Iceland. You're gonna see North America on the left. You're gonna see Europe on the right. You're gonna see the crack that divides and where the spreading is happening every day at the rate of your fingernail growth a year. It's overly dramatic. I uh, apologize for that aspect of it, but it, you'll get the idea. While some plates crash together, others tear apart. It happens under the ocean. Like here, in the middle of the Atlantic. Love after rust at the boundary. Two crustal plates sealing the tear. This is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. A 10,000 mile tear on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. The ridge is a line of underwater volcanoes, and it's here that new oceanic crust is formed. It stretches from the South Atlantic all the way to Iceland in the north, where it rises above sea level. From the air, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is an awesome sight. This dramatic scar in the landscape marks the boundary between the North American crustal plate on the left side and the European plate on the right. The gap between ocean plates is filling in at a rate of an inch a year. Part of the restless movement of the Earth's crust that's reshaping our world. Um, and then this, um I talked a minute ago about uh, an eruption there um, uh, just a couple years ago. I really remember when uh, Obama got stuck over in Europe because there was an eruption in Iceland, and the ash went up, and he, his plane couldn't fly back. Okay, so this ash layer basically is um, pure glass. Now, this is a piece of pumice. This shot out of a volcano and landed somewhere. Maybe it went up 1,000 feet and landed. It's, sh it's shot full of air. There's more air in here than rock. It, it, it can float. This doesn't, but pumice typically floats. But this material that's in here can be pulverized into fine ash, and it gets aloft and floats, and it can float for weeks and weeks and weeks. And planes have to avoid it because it's pure glass. If the turbine in a jet engine uh, hits that glass and flies through, it'll melt to the turbine, the plane will crash, it won't be able to fly immediately. So planes avoid it. Uh, even Obama was stuck. Uh, they flew him south and got him out of that ash layer. But if you're regular at United, you're sitting there for two weeks. I had a friend sitting there for two weeks in, in uh, Europe trying to get home because they have to wait for the ash layer. And they map it on, on air, air traffic control, maps it on radar, they can see it. They know exactly where to put the flights. And that, uh, that route, as you know, you probably know, the route from Europe to North America is not you know, straight across uh, the globe. You go over the North Pole, and so you're gonna go over Iceland, and you're gonna, or towards the North Pole. You're gonna do the great circle over that, and that's where the ash layer was. So this is, uh, just real quick, this is another, um, this is that eruption. And uh, I only show it, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of nice to see, it's interesting to see um, eruption through ice, okay? It's different from Hawaii where you see eruption through a tropical kind of scenery. Here in Iceland, when it erupts through ice, and it does erupt through ice up on the main glacier in Iceland, it melts the ice immediately. And so in addition to an, a volcanic event, you get a torrential flood. And over the centuries, time after time, bridges, it floods down the coast, Time after time, towns and, and bridges get wiped out. When you drive along the south part of Iceland, you see the old bridges, right? You yeah. see things wiped out. Um, and it's just, you, you can't control it. And there's YouTube videos of this, of the torrential floods I don't have it here. This kind of, I show this because it's a little bit of an example of the stupidity of science sometimes, that in order to, to get uh, some, you know, a, a good reading or, or, or observation, you stand 100 feet from a volcanic vent, where if the wind switched even a little bit, you'd be dead. Right. The wind came down from the north on top of that guy, he'd be dead. So 
this is more this is more about like showing good judgment as a scientist. Maybe you would want to do this. Uh, this is the ash, and this ash once it goes, it floats for for uh, a long period of time. Lucas, what's your question? Um, my question is um, so <coughs> it's pure glass. Um, I thought it was um. To a large extent, it's uh, magma, molten rock, and so then it turn into rock, and it wouldn't turn it's, into it's, uh, like It's to a large glass. extent, it's silica. If that's what uh, these windows are made out of, more than sil silica. It's it's a high percentage of it is pure silica. Now there's impurities in it. This is obsidian. This is lava that just came out of a volcano and flowed down a side and formed this. But this uh, silica is the largest uh, component of that rock. Okay, next thing is plates collide. We talked about plates spreading. Now we're going to do plates colliding. Uh, things get more interesting on the planet when this happens. Uh, we're going to talk about those mountain belts, the, the 14,000 mile long mountain belts and the deep water trenches. You can see the ocean was spreading and spreading, but eventually it hit a continent. And the continent, we said, is less dense, and the ocean, we said, is more dense and thinner. They're going to collide. One's going to go below the other. Which one's going to go below the other? Which one, every 100% of the time, every time, the what plate would go below the other. Oceanic, Oceanic is going to go down every single time it's pure physics. Um, when it does, three things happen. First is, it's rock against rock, and it doesn't move smoothly. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an even flowing thing. Tensions build up, builds up, builds up, and releases every once in a while in the form of earthquakes. The second thing that happens is, because it's rock dragging against rock, it starts to drag the continental crust down. And so you can see where the trenches start to form. Those deep water trenches are right there where the continent, the ocean, the oceanic crust is trying to drag down the continental crust. That's the second thing that happens. The third thing, this is solid rock, solid oceanic crust. It starts to dive down into the mantle. It's solid rock. It gets really hot down there. Eventually the solid rock is gonna do what? Melt. melt. When things melt and they get hot, they do what? We've said we talked about it before. They rise. They rise. They rise. This, this, molten, this melted crust, this molten magma now rises. It finds a weakness in the crust. It's going to poke through, pokes through the line of volcanoes. So you, you, now, you now understand how the trench formed in the line of volcanoes. It's, it's a one for one relationship. The oceanic crust is going to meet resistance. It's going to create earthquakes. It's going to drag down, create a trench. It, within 100 or 125 miles, typically, it's going to get down deep enough where it melts and it comes up in the form of a volcano. And so this is the, uh, an animation, a quick, go ahead, yeah. Yes. Um, so is it possible that the <coughs> Well, you've always got spreading, and then you've always got consumption. So it's kind of a, it's a balanced thing, although, you know, the diameter of the Earth does change, but it's very, we're going to talk about that in a second. It's little variations. It's not it's not miles and miles and miles of circumference changing, but there can be you know hundreds of feet and feet and you know in and out over the years. Um, this is this is a um, quick animation. It goes fast. I'll play it twice. This is the ocean trying to dive below the continent. The tension builds up. It, it releases intermittently in the form of an earthquake. The energy is released to the surface. It propagates out in the form of What's that? Tsunami. tsunami. We all know a little bit about tsunamis. Does anybody want to guess how fast that wave propagates out over the open ocean? Somebody who hasn't said anything. Um, in miles per hour. What? In miles per hour. How fast does it travel? 100 miles, that's a good guess. Then, to me, this is one of the more amazing facts in geology, besides the fact that man appeared four seconds ago. Uh, this is this is number two fact. Uh, anybody else? Miles per hour. Just a guess. 200. 200. One more guess. 300. Okay. Uh, tsunamis propagate out in deep water at the speed of a jet plane. Five, six hundred, sometimes seven hundred miles an hour. But I thought the way. Okay, the how big do we think a tsunami is in the oh. open ocean? In the open ocean. In the open ocean. Before it hits the coastline. A tsunami in the open ocean is six inches to a foot. You don't even know it passed by your boat. The reason we know the propagation of it is we have satellites with telemetry and we can map the surface of the ocean within an inch. Um, only when the energy of that tsunami hits a shallow coastline does it jack up and you know look like a wave, look like a tsunami. It's not it's not like a typical wave, but 
we're gonna, we're gonna sh I'm gonna show you that in a second. Isn't it true, like, Chabra? go ahead. Race. Oh. Yeah, go Isn't ahead. it true, right before a tsunami, the water's really calm? <coughs> yeah, absolutely. And it goes back. What happens before a tsunami is, um, hang on a second. Is uh, the water gets sucked out, and so in Indonesia, what happened was people got lulled into that. It's, it's like a beautiful day. All of a sudden, they're seeing seafloor that they had never seen in their life, maybe out a mile. It depends on the, the angle of the, the, the shelf there. And they can walk out, and they can they started to collect shells. And this happened over and over on the planet in, in various large tsunamis. And then the ocean comes in, and we're going to see a video of how it comes in. It comes in rather violently, and there's no way to escape it at that point. So. That calm you're talking about, that's the calm. It's like, oh, where the ocean goes? Beautiful day, there's no waves, absolutely no waves, and then boom. Okay, so guess what? You guys understand this, you understand this, you understand how this formed, all this, all the way around the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you could explain it to anybody now. Yeah, you could, you could. This is a ring of fire. This is what happens around the Pacific. It's where the subduction is happening beneath continental crust all around the Pacific. This, these are some stats. You might want to write a couple of these down. This is what happens around the ring, the ring of fire. 90% of the world's earthquakes are in this area. 80% of the large earthquakes here. And 75% of the world's active volcanoes. So really, when you talk about tectonic activity happening along margins, plate boundaries, a lot of it is right here. Now, the Haiti earthquake, the Indonesian earthquake, no. There's plenty of other activity. But this is the single biggest focus on the planet, the ring of fire. Can I ask a question, Mike? Mm -hmm. When you mentioned that the ocean goes back, what causes the ocean to go back to the ocean? The, um, the, the uh, disruption of the ocean, the sinking of the, uh, the, the, the movement of, of the, the, the shift of the plates that just occurred creates sort of a void out there where water is sucked exactly. in. Yeah. Okay, and, then it, and then it comes back. Everybody got what they need here? Jersey, uh, or the one in Virginia we felt from, uh, on the East Coast from Virginia to Maine. That was a 4.1, I believe. That shook for four seconds. Uh, not a big deal. In fact, on the internet, they had kind of a funny thing where they showed a Starbucks coffee cup tipped over with a little coffee, you know, dribbling out. That was our East Coast earthquake, right? These earthquakes in Indonesia and, and Japan, they changed people's lives. They, for generations, they killed thousands. <laughs> for four seconds, he thought it was a massaging chair. Okay, so you don't feel these, but these big ones, you can see the frequency goes way down. We only have one of the, you know, a huge one maybe once every year. A couple years ago, we had a couple. You know, we had Haiti, we had Chile, and the next year we had Chile. It just seemed like they, they kept coming. But on average, they're one a year. Okay, where's this? What's this? Oh, wait, wait, somebody has to say anything. Who's, where's this? Um, prettiest mountain in the world. No, 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 no. Mount, you can't see water uh, Mount Everest. Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji in Japan. Oh, yeah. oh. Okay, so now, until a couple minutes ago, or maybe a week ago, when uh, Marsha was teaching you your first part of geology, this is just a pretty picture. You see the book, you take a picture, and that's it, right? Okay, so now that you understand exactly how it formed, and you do understand how it formed, it adds another dimension. Now, I'm not saying you guys appreciate completely how powerful that is, but let me just tell you that that's powerful. You can go anywhere on the planet, 
and see a mountain like this, and you, you can go to 99% of volcanoes, not the ones in Hawaii, and you know exactly how they form now. Okay, so we're, we're sitting here in a boat, or we're, hang one sec, okay? We're lucky enough to be here, or we just saw the picture in a book, and we're talking to our friends or our parents, and we, we can explain to them what happened. Now, if this was a Jersey shore, and we were out this far in a boat, we might be under 30, 40 foot of water, max. But we know that there's a very deep ocean trench under here. We don't know how deep it is unless we had a map. But it could be 5,000, it could be 10,000, it's very, very deep. Why? Because we know the oceanic crust dove down, it dragged the continental crust down, created this deep trench. We know that that crust kept going down and eventually got deep enough to do what? Melt and come up in the form of magma and create, where did it come up? Where did the magma come up? Right where that mountain is, right off the top of that mountain. That's how the crust went down, melted, came up, formed the volcano. 100% of the, the explanation, there's great detail you can get into the chemistry and the physics of it, but for a general explanation of how it happened, you understand how it happened. Is that a little bit more powerful than just looking at a pretty picture in a book? Yeah, yeah. yes. So in other words, that mountain is just, just, just really cool. No, it didn't move. The, the, the continental crust was it? here. The continental crust was where that land is. The ocean came at it. It, it had to go somewhere. It dove down. <laughs> It melted, and the magma came up and formed Mount Fuji. The lava came out of Mount Fuji, and it just kept forming and forming Mount Fuji. You follow it? So that's a volcano. It's a dormant volcano. Well, actually, it, a couple hundred years ago, and it will go up again, I'm guessing. Oh, wait, question, question. Yeah. Um, what's the town or, like, something that got, like, totally destroyed by a volcano? Yeah, in Hawaii. Japan. I, in Hawaii. Well, in Japan and Hawaii. Uh, I don't know the name of either town. <laughs> but uh, we're going to look at the town that got destroyed in Japan. Here we go with the Japanese earthquake. Um, sorry, go ahead. It depends. It depends on what that activity is like with the crust going down. Now I don't know. I, I, I think I've looked at something the last couple of years where they think that Fuji be, could become active again. That it, you know. Few hundred years ago, it was somebody put here might know the last time it went off in Wikipedia, real quick. Uh, but that it could go off again. I will tell you that the most dangerous place to be on the planet right now, as far as far as human um, civilization goes, and volcanoes, is a place you would not expect. It's Naples, Italy, because Vesuvius is a very active volcano. It was active in, in uh, human history. You, you, you go to Pompeii, you can go to uh, that other town, maybe it was Vesuvius. And you can see the, the ruins. Uh, and there's a magma chamber under there that stretches from the mountain all the way, 20 miles away to Naples, and it's gonna erupt sometime in the next hundred, couple hundred years. And, and trust me, geologists and geophysicists are all over it trying to figure out what to do. Let me just try to move on because I'm gonna start running out of time and I want you guys to see this. Um, now, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about the Japanese uh, or a tsunami. This is the, we learn more about tsunamis in this one than any other one because it happened during the day happened in a part of the planet where there's a lot of technology. The Indonesian earthquake, uh, it, it was it happened during the day, but is it a part of the planet where there just wasn't a lot of technology? We didn't have a warning system in the Indian Ocean at the time. Uh, there, was, there was no way, uh, people died in every country around the Indian Ocean. The wave moves at 700 miles an hour. In seven hours, the wave was over in Africa. People were dying in villages in Africa. In India, 250,000 people died. No communications, really not a good record of it. Um, Japan, horrible human disaster. 15,000 people died in a matter of minutes. We have um, 16,000. We have, uh, you know, the silver lining is that we have lots of good information on it so we can learn a little bit from it, what happened, maybe how to avoid uh, such human loss in the future. Um, but some of these stats are, are quite amazing. I wouldn't write it, you know, all these down, but uh, this, this shook for six minutes. Okay, a big California earthquake. I haven't been in one, but I understand, you know, if you go 30 seconds, somebody said something earlier. 30 seconds, that's a long time, a minute. You can have a minute there. Six minutes, the one in Indonesia shook nine minutes. <clears throat> you think your life ended 100 times because it starts to shake and the, the earth gets rubbery. There's a, there's a um, there's something called liquefaction where the, the soil is kind of sandy 
it almost becomes a liquidy thing. Buildings will collapse. You can't maneuver, you can't run. You, uh, there's no way you can balance yourself. You get down on your knees and you hope it ends. So the running is over at that point when everything starts shaking. So it's, uh, you know, none of us have lived through it. We don't know exactly. You can kind of look at the YouTubes and I talk to everybody I can about it. It is the most frightening thing you can imagine. Um, well, my brother, Yeah, no, all the buildings in Japan and Chile now. Chile's amazing, the, the engineering that goes on. These buildings can shake like this now. They, I don't know what they can do. They can probably do, I'll just make it up, 20 feet at the top. They're not going to topple. They're all on gimbals. They're, uh, that's, that's what engineers do, become an engineer. Um, the, yeah. The, okay, so the most amazing thing here, and you, you shook how long? I forget, you said 30? About 30, 40 seconds. Yeah, that, that's like, your life ended. Instead of 100 times, maybe five times, right? Right. Just like, when, when's it going to end? Is it ever going to end? The fear, right? Yeah. You just don't know. Could you not move? Did, after a while, was it like, did, was the ground kind of doing this? We were outside of the house, and yeah, you couldn't really walk. Yeah. Okay. All right. In addition to all this human uh, tragedy, what happened was Japan moved eight feet on the planet. If that doesn't, that's the third most amazing fact we're going to give today. Eight feet on the planet. In the Chilean earthquake, Buenos Aires, not even in Chile, moved a foot on the planet. Okay, so it doesn't matter, but the Earth's axis shifted, and the length of the year changed. The length of the year changed in milliseconds. It doesn't matter to anybody. We would never know it, but geophysicists figured it out, and this is the physics behind that. Think of an ice skater at Rockefeller Center, and they're spinning. They have their arms out, and they're spinning. What happens when the skater brings their arms in? What happens to the, the speed of the spin? Spin faster. We have a planet. All of a sudden, it got eight feet smaller, and the Earth is spinning. Now it's eight feet smaller. What happened to the spin of the planet? It got faster. It got faster, so the length of the year shortened four milliseconds. Cool. Not a lot of time. But the atomic clocks get shifted, and the geophysicists take it into account because to them it's important. Uh, okay, this this is um, a super serious video. Uh, sometimes people have a tendency to start um, laughing a little bit in the beginning. Don't. Um, I show it because it's now part of history. Even though a lot of people are dying, it's really important. It's really important to, uh, to to absorb this and see what happens. Now, hold on. The um, this this news helicopter was up in the air. It didn't have time. To, it didn't say, "Oh, there, was, there just was an earthquake. I'm going up." They were up covering the story, and they they see this thing happening. They see the tsunami coming. And you can, you can hear it in his voice. Now it's Japanese, we don't understand it. But you get a sense for, you know, he understands the calamity that's about, about to occur. Now this wave that you're gonna see, okay, uh, I've got tape rolling, I'm hesitant to say this. I'm a surfer, I surf around the planet. I, I, I've seen waves everywhere, big waves, small waves. This is not a wave. These are not waves, these are unrelated to waves. This is a wall of sea that's 15 feet high, boiling, 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 not hot water, boiling, boiling, you're gonna see the steam coming off it. It's so violent. The water went out, the water's coming in, and the sea level's coming in 15 feet higher. Okay, what happens? When it hits the, the village, it keeps going. The ocean just keeps coming. It's not like the Jersey Shore, wave comes in, wave goes out, wave comes in. It just goes. It goes five miles in or more until it finds a mountain or a hill that stops it. And then there's another one. 15 feet of sea level change coming in and hits the town. So that's what you're going to see, and this, I, I don't think this has really ever been seen before. So here's the wave. Okay, uh, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. 130 miles of ocean crust was diving below Japan, and it snapped all at one minute. 130, did I say 130 feet? 130 miles. Okay, 130 miles snapped. It was trying to subduct, and then there was a movement. That movement was rel roughly uh, eight, nine, ten feet. I don't know exactly. It was in that order of magnitude. It wasn't 100 feet. It wasn't one foot. Eight, nine, ten feet. Snap. This razor sharp line of waves is the result of that crust moving. Um, 
in, in, in a violent fashion. So you can't get the scale, but that's probably 15 feet of white water. Solid white water. Solid ocean coming at you. And that's one. Then he turns around and sees the other. One, two, and maybe three. <coughs> All right? So these waves are just marching. Now I say it was 700 miles an hour in the open ocean. When the waves, when the wave starts to feel the bottom, it slows down. Now it's moving maybe 30, 40. So they were saying the same thing you were saying. They were saying it's one wave, two waves, three waves, four waves. Yeah. You know, huge waves coming up, coming at the surface. Yeah. Never one. You speak Japanese. You speak Japanese? Yeah. That's what they were saying right now. Is that what you're saying? Okay. I'm gonna. Here's a moment of impact. Okay, it's not a it's not a toy village. It's not a Hollywood set. It's it, it's these waves take anything out they touch. There's nothing that can survive. There's nothing that can withstand it. And just remember, when when these people are trying to escape, everybody else is trying to escape on these narrow historic village streets. It's full of cars. It's full of people. There's, there's the people that survived were on the sides of the town, got up the hills. But. I just appreciate the educational aspect of this. That we, we need to figure out a way to uh, predict this a little bit better. Or have better seawalls. Do we have seawalls that could actually? I think there are seawalls that could have deflected this. I don't know. I'm not an engineer, but I think that's that would be uh, one way to go. I don't remember what the movie was called. My dad was watching a movie about what they think the future is going to be like and what, like the technology and stuff. And then because they think that so many hurricanes and tsunamis are... Just one second while you're talking. Do you see the water just filtering back through the town? Hang on. And it just it just goes and goes. It stops at a embankment, but it'll go over and it'll keep going through flat fields forever. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. And um, they had this thing where like, um, they, like it's like a metal wall and when they predict there's going to be a hurricane, So, I mean, it's pretty strong for yeah. something like Well, the walls are a way, uh, we, we think, uh, some people think New York can be uh, protected a little bit against a sandy type of uh, occurrence uh, with, a, with a barrier. I mean, it's big thinking, it's a $20 billion project, but they're probably going to put a barrier up <coughs> like that <coughs> in front of Venice to protect Venice. Not necessarily from tsunamis, but from surges. And so it's the same idea. I, I, I don't know. I'm going to keep going because I only have a couple minutes. This is the moment of impact in uh, Indonesia. I only put it up here because it's clear that you have no idea. It, it happened so fast. And um, that one took for nine seconds, as I said. Um, let's, let's um, I only ran out of time. I can't believe it. I ran out of time. Yeah, we have until 11. Until, oh, until 11. Let us look at the rocks for a second. Okay, before you look at the rocks, let me go through what they are. Okay, so. Remember, 65 million years old, as old as dinosaurs, I'm betting dinosaurs actually ate some of these things. They were in the same pond, dinosaurs walking around, eating these things. This is lava that flowed out of a volcano in Hawaii. Essentially, glass like in the windows. Almost be careful silica. of that one, it can be sure. Maybe only 15,000 years old, but a snail. Fossil. This shot out of a volcano, as I said, more air than rock. This is fool's gold. It, it's not man-made. It's it's perfect cubes. Two cubes grew together. It's worthless. There's no economic value to it, but it's beautiful. Uh, this is malachite. It's a, it's copper. I've got copper over there that you would use to make things. This is what American Indians would use for jewelry. It's so beautiful. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on, hang on. Calcite. This is in your vitamins. All right, any vitamin you ever took, calcite, gypsum. Every wall and every house you ever lived in, apartment, sheetrock is made out of this. We mine gypsum to get sheetrock. Petrified wood from Yellowstone. Geyser went up, 2,000 degree water came down, flowed, hit a tree. The, the minerals in the water, it cooled. The minerals solidified into rock. It's not wood anymore, but you see the texture of the bark. You see the wood replaced by, the, by this rock. Lead zinc picked this up. Lead zinc, super, super heavy. Um, iron, magnet, copper for pennies. We still make penny 
Chinese, who knows why? And all right, you can very pretty. Okay. Uh, come look, five, a couple minutes on either side. Let's divide up.